Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. My name is Nika Larian, food loss and waste advisor and producer of the USAID Kitchen Sink. Today, we have a special episode celebrating the fourth International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. FAO has announced the theme for this year is Reducing Food Loss and Waste, Taking Action to Transform Agri-Food Systems. Therefore, it is my honor to introduce our guest for today's episode, Maximo Torero Colon, the Chief Economist of the Food and Agriculture Association, or FAO. Maximo will be joined by Ahmed Kablan, Senior Science Advisor and Food Loss and Waste Co-Lead at USAID. Today, we will make the economic case for food loss and waste. What are the economic impacts? What are the trade-offs? And how can we achieve the economic benefits of reducing food loss and waste? Welcome, Maximo. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, it's a pleasure to, to be here. My name is, as you said, Maximo torero Callen. I am the Chief Economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I am based here in Rome. Uh, before I was in the World Bank and before that in the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Maximo, for joining us today for this episode of uh, USAID Kitchen Sink Food Loss and Waste uh, episode. Um, USAID promotes the triple wins opportunity of addressing food loss and waste to improve nutrition, food security, uh, climate, and economic development. Maximo, can you set the stage for us by discussing the importance of addressing food loss and waste for food security efforts? Look, uh, this is a topic that, that is extremely relevant and it has not been in the radar for many years. Um, and let me explain you why it's so relevant. So today we have more than 700 million people which are chronically undernourished. We have 3.1 billion people that don't have access to what we call a healthy diet, a minimum cost healthy diet. Uh, and in that context, the level of, of losses is 13.2% of the global production, and the level of waste is 17% of the global production. So that is kind of contradictory, no? So we have a problem of people that cannot eat, that has enormous hunger, or is malnourishing themselves, uh, and we have a lot of food that we are losing and wasting. Now, one of the major concerns for, for FAO was the definition, because there was a lot of confusion across literature and, and knowledge by policymakers of what was loss and what was waste. So loss is every, everything that happens up to the wholesale included. And waste is from the retail to the consumer. Why it's so important to have a clarity of definition? is because the policies that you need to implement to reduce losses and the policies you need to implement to, to reduce waste are very different. So it doesn't make any sense to mix both elements together. So why is this so impactful? Um, when you are able to reduce losses, let's focus for a second just in losses, forget waste for a second. If we reduce losses, what it means? It means that a farmer will have more commodity to sell to the market. It means that prices could reduce, and therefore consumers will be able to afford. The majority of the losses in high-value commodities, which are essential for healthy diets. So that will mean that the healthy diets will be more accessible. The second element is that it will also allow us to use our natural resources more efficiently. You know, we live in a world of water stress. We live in a world where soil uh, and good quality soil is not so, so abundant anymore. And therefore, we need to use our natural resources in the most efficient way. And that is what this will imply, because you will be able to produce more with less natural resources. And the third element is environment. And that's the, the three components that you were referring at the beginning of your question. Why environment? Because when we produce, we generate emissions. And if we lost that production, we lost that investment in those emissions, and we have to reduce them. But even more, when we destroy the food that we are producing, 
we can create even more emissions. And that's more important even for waste. Because in the side of waste, which is in the consumer side, in the retail side, normally the food will go to landfills, it will be burned, and it will create a lot more emissions uh, to the world. So right now it's estimated that between 8 to 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from food loss and waste. So significant benefits. We even did some simulations uh, in trying to compare policies to implement reduction of food losses compared to policies to increase productivity yield, to expand land, and many other policies. And the only one that show positive benefits, so less trade-offs outside of more availability for healthy diets, was food loss and waste, because it reduced also the negative trade-off over environment by reduction of emissions and by reduction of inefficient use of natural resources. So that's the context in which we are. Now, many people will tell you, uh, oh, but if you reduce, you increase the supply, you will also reduce the prices for producers, and that will affect producers. And we can talk a lot about that, but that's not necessarily the case, because we need to understand that in this world, producers can differentiate their product. And if they can have higher standards, therefore they can pay charge different prices. So yes, the generic product could lower the price, but the differentiated product of a higher quality or standard could increase even their price because they comply and they lost less in the production. Thank you, Maximo. That's very enlightening and highlighting the importance of clarity on defining what exactly we mean with each one of them. And I like how you referred it up, referred to it to producing more with less, and less means less resources needed and less uh, impact on the environment, but more for the farmers and more for the consumers. Maximo, talking about investing in food loss and waste reduction effort, what are the economic impacts and potential trade-offs? In other words, do we have a strong economic case to invest in food loss and waste reduction effort? What are the various considerations we need to take into account when we are thinking about the return on investment? Yes and no. And let me explain you why. I think the first problem that we have today is that we have very little data to identify where in the value chains and why losses occur. Waste is a little bit different because we know the major reasons why it occurs and we can discuss about that. But if we focus on losses, which is more difficult, especially when you are in developing countries where you have a lot of farmers, uh, atomized farmers, smallholder producers, then you have to give them technologies to, to reduce that. And what we have found, I, I did uh, with some other colleagues, we did a, a meta-analysis, a meta-literature review of all the interventions to reduce losses. And what we found there is that first, there was very little results in terms of cost-effectiveness analysis. Second, most of the interventions were on post-harvest, not in pre-harvest, and not in the whole value chain. Third, there was very little causality analysis, so very little evidence of the returns, okay? And in most cases, they were just targeting storage. Now, as a result of that, we decided to start doing a better data collection process uh, to look at where really the losses occur. And we have done this now for more than 15 countries, where we have developed, first we developed three methodologies uh, to measure losses and identify which of the three methodologies was more close to real. And when I mean real is because I had the capacity of for beans in, in Honduras to track the grain across to see what really effective was lost. So that was my real measure. And then I compared my methodologies, which were more on self-response. Like, for example, I can ask you as a farmer how much you lost in this stage, in this stage, in this stage. So we came out with, with these three methodologies, and we found that one was the most close to reality, very close. And then we, we measure across the value chain where, where the losses were happening. And what we found is that most of the losses occur before the, the, the storage. So during the production process, during the harvesting process, and during the transportation, even before the step of going to storage. Of course, there are losses in the storage, but not at the highest level. That what tells you is, wow, so a lot of the investment that we have done in storage could have helped, but there is a lot more that we have to do. For example, if the grain is not dried enough and it goes to storage, it will create aflatoxins. No, we know that. But then the technology is, I need to dry it better at the level that is needed to be able to store in the plastic hermetic bags or in the silos. If I don't do that, then I create a bigger problem. If there are pests and disease, pests in the, in the grain, then that will be transferred to storage and then the problem become bigger. The other problem that we found was that 
there is a lot of losses because of left in the field. And this is very typical of fruits, and especially on fruits, partially on vegetables. Why? Because if I am a mango producer, and I produce mangoes for export market, and I am a collection of smallholders that sell the mango to a company through contract farming arrangements, the company will only select the caliper and the size of the mango that they need to export. And they will leave in the tree the mango that they don't care about, because that's what they are making money. They're making money for a market which is requiring certain caliper, color, and size. And therefore, they will make a lot of resources with that, but they will transfer the left in the field to the farmer. So a lot of the losses were left in the field, which before we didn't know. And that's because farmers don't find it profitable to cut what is remaining and to sell it to a local market because the price is very low. And that's where innovations on how to process that mango to create frozen mango, for example, and so on could bring and had to reduce uh, what is left in the field. Then we found that there is a lot of uh, capacity and human capital issues. For example, in beans, they try to automatize the harvest and they basically break the grain. And then you don't get the quality grain that you have. So the point I'm trying to make is that when we do a detailed analysis of the value chain, then we really find the source of the problem and then we can really implement the proper solutions to minimize that. That could make it more cost effective, okay? Because today, we have not seen too much cost effectiveness of the interventions. In the case of waste, there are two elements there. One is at the level of the retail, which regulatory measures help a lot. So the duration of the life in the shelf, for example. So a small changes in regulation could create significant impacts. And then there is the consumer side, which is more behavioral. And that is a little bit more complex too, because you have to change behavior on people. Or you have to provide alternatives for people to change that behavior. No, like for example, ready to sell or, or these all these apps that you have today that are linked to food banks where you can deliver or you can buy food at a cheaper rate. But that's a component of behavioral change where the effectiveness could be huge if the environment facilitates that behavioral change on the consumer side. In the losses side, I think uh, of the interventions that we have done, we have found that they are extremely cost effective. We also have found that the market oriented interventions are the biggest ones in terms of return. For example, we did a very nice experiment with a randomized control trial in beans in Honduras and Guatemala, where we offer three solutions to, to the market. One is we provide the seeds and the fertilizer, the traditional package, so that we can have more resistant crops and, uh, and avoid loss because of, of less water and so on. The second one was we provide the linkage to the market, so a buyer uh, plus technical assistance. In the three of them, we provide technical assistance. And in the third one, we provide the linkage to the market and a price incentive. Okay, what you will normally have thought is that the package plus the technical assistance will provide what you wanted. But what we found was that the, the price incentive make the farmers buy what they needed and they were able to provide the quality grain that the company needed and therefore they get the price premium. So I think we need a lot of work still to, to identify uh, what will be the most cost effective. But the first point I think is to understand where the problem is in, in, in the value chain. Now, there is some literature, recent literature saying that it's impossible to have zero loss. And I completely agree. Nobody's saying that loss should be zero. What we are saying is if we can reduce the loss as much as possible, that will bring a benefit for sure, because the benefits will be direct and indirect, no? So the direct benefits we already have discussed, efficiency in use of resources, so less cost of inputs, more availability of food, so I can sell more commodities, and uh, 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 environmental issues. But then there are all the indirect effects linked to climate and so on and so forth that could be also a part of, of the return. So I don't have any doubt that reduction of losses could be uh, cost effective. It's just that we need to really identify where the problem is, and that's where analysis and data can play a big role. Thank you, Maximo. And this is more of a call for action and call for for better data and identification for the most appropriate ways to address losses and where it happens. And the example from storage, as you highlighted, just speaks to that where we need to identify where we need to focus our investment by identifying where losses or waste happening in the most uh, in the in the value chain per country context. Uh, Maximo, uh, final question for you. What needs to be done to achieve those benefits of reducing food loss and waste, as you highlight? Look, uh, I think one concept that is important to understand is that uh, when we refer to losses, it's not only totally loss, so quantity loss in the production, but it's also quality loss. 
Because if a farmer produces a grain that doesn't comply with the requirements, for example, durum wheat for pasta, they have very concrete requirements, okay? They have like four parameters that you need to get. Then the value of what you sell is lower, and that's an economic loss, okay? Because you are not complying with the parameters. Totally loss, of course, you lost everything you produce. But I think the quality loss is very important. That's what we did also in this methodology. We call it the attribute method. Uh, so what will help to do this is first, it's important to, again, to identify where the losses occur. Second, it's important to understand what are these parameters of attributes that the commodity needs to comply so that it's not discarded. In fruits, it's very easy, no? When you go and sell your fruit and it's damaged because it's different color, it's not perfect, then of course the market won't, won't pay for it. They will uh, punish the price. The same in milk. When you collect milk, you look at attributes. And then depending on the attributes, how much fat, how much water, and so on and so forth, you get a different price. That's economic loss, no? So we need to understand those attributes. But on the other side, we need that the market recognizes those attributes. Because if the market doesn't recognize those attributes, why the farmer will invest in this problem? I always give this example, maize with aflatoxins, okay? I explain the farmer that aflatoxins could create cancer. I explain them what they need to do to resolve. The farmer believes me, and he does all the changes, the proper drying, the proper packaging, so that the maize doesn't have aflatoxins. Then he takes his grain to the market. And then there is the other farmer which didn't like what I said, didn't hear what I said, didn't invest. He takes also his grain to the market. The buyer will look at the yellow maize. He won't be able or she won't be able to identify which one has aflatoxins and which doesn't because it's not observable. And if the market doesn't recognize for that different attribute, then they will get paid the same. So why the farmer will make the decision to invest in reduction of aflatoxins if he's not getting the proper incentive in the market? And that's exactly uh, what we need to change. So there is a role for the producer and for the technology and for the government to support, identify where the losses are and the causes. But then there is also another mechanism that we need to bring more uh, recognition in the market of the attribute, attributes and the quality we want. And there has to be a price premium for that quality and that the standard. In the case of aflatoxin, is testing. We need to randomly test. It's what WFP does today. When they buy grain, they have to test for aflatoxin and they will pay a higher price and a premium. That's what we need, that recognition that pays back the effort. That's what I want saying. It could be that I produce more, but if I have the quality standards, I could get a price premium and that will compensate the bigger supply in the world. So that's essential. In the case of waste, I think it's essential that we start changing behavior and we need to inform. One of the latest projects we are doing right now, for example, in resorts, in hotels, no? we are now developing a simple methodology where people can measure by separating the different foods that you discard in the in the kitchen uh, and in the in the in the restaurants of the hotels or the resorts, what they do in terms of how much they waste in, in vegetables, in fruits, and so on and so forth. And we can map that to kilograms, we can map that to calories, we can map that to emissions, and so on and so forth. So whenever you finish, you will see all these beans, and then you have a machine at the top that says this is how much you are wasting. Okay, we believe that that will help in terms of behavior, it will also help the kitchen to understand what mistakes they are doing in the way they are supplying the food to the consumers. The portions are too big. Most of it is, is thrown out and so on and so forth. The same applies on how you purchase food at your house. So how we can inform people of the benefits of changing their behavior in purchasing food so that we waste less in, in the market. So many things can be done, uh, I think, very quickly. And today, because of the situation that we are facing in terms of hunger in the world, I think it's essential that we accelerate that process and to change that. One of the things that we are doing in FAO is we are creating an app called FLAP, F-L-A-P, so Food Loss App, which is specifically for food loss, where basically we have programmed this methodology that I was referring at the beginning, and we are thinking that we can crowdsource in information from farmers. So if a company that is working with many farmers, uh, that is, is, is PepsiCo or, or, or big company that is working with farmers, they can share the app with the, with the farmers. The farmers can fill the information. The information will be crowdsourced into, into the cloud. We will be able to analyze the information of thousands of millions of farmers, identify the problem, but not only that, the farmer will get links to videos to find solutions uh, so that they can identify their problems and then immediately click to a video with a high-tech solution and a low-tech solution when you have a huge budget constraint. So I think those type of innovations could accelerate and reduce the cost of collecting the data and also to self-identify your problem and try to find solutions to that problem. 
Well, thank you, Maxim. This is really very compelling case to address and to look at different ways to, uh, to reduce food loss and waste. I like your call for action here, which is to fight hunger and the rising need for high quality diets and importance of achieving the minimum acceptable diet, especially in light of the current challenges that we are facing, whether it is COVID, climate change, uh, Ukraine, Russia war, all of these things are affecting our food supply. This is a clear call for action. We need to act now. There is no time to lose actually to act toward reducing food loss and waste to produce more with less, less resources, conserve our natural resources, reduce our impact on the environment. Thank you so much, Maximo, for this uh, interview and with for this podcast. This was very informative and I hope our audience will find it useful. Nika, back to you. Thanks, Ahmed. And thank you, Maximo, for participating in this episode today. Very insightful and informative conversation to mark this International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. So thank you for starting the conversation, but definitely one that we need to continue. Thank you both. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, Ahmed Kablan and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the US government's global food security initiative and the USAID Center for Nutrition.